All right, cool. So thank you to, um, to Leo there for showing some of the, the, the power of uh, analog and physical modeling and numerical modeling approaches uh, to studying salt tectonics. So in this, in this talk, we're gonna be a bit, a bit more broad, a bit more general, and kind of give an overview of kind of the role that we see, uh, or one view of the role of salt tectonics and salt tectonic research in the energy transition. Um, <clears throat> so I will uh, outline quickly now what I mean by that. So this now here is just a kind of, if we take a step back and think um, from a simple perspective about how people have viewed salt basins uh, to a large extent over the last century, uh, here is a schematic view. And we're particularly thinking here with a petroleum industry mindset, which is what has guided a lot of research and where a lot of uh, time has been spent on salt tectonics. So with this perspective, uh, you can look at a salt basin, something like this. Uh, whereby from an oil and gas perspective, you are looking for uh, traps, uh, uh, drilling for oil on the flanks of salt structures uh, or in deformed sediments, in turtle structures uh, around your salt bodies, either adjacent to, above or below the salt. Um, and the reason for that is that the salt is, has some fundamental properties which are really useful for that, i.e. the salt, it, it seals, it's, it's impermeable in most cases to, to uh, oil and gas flowing through it, which can help trap it. It's thermally conductive, so it influences the maturity of hydrocarbons. And it's also mobile, so it creates this myriad array of, of salt geometries uh, and obviously influences the deposition and nature and character of the sediments surrounding the salt bodies. So that's a, a kind of traditional view. But, but thankfully, those properties of, of salt are also really useful for a range of energy transition technologies, or so we're finding out. Um, so in particular, you can start to switch your, how you view a salt basin. So now instead of, for example, looking for oil and gas in the surrounding sediments, you may now start to use some of those uh, geometries and, and reservoir characteristics uh, in the salt deformed sediments to start to now inject and sequester your CO2. Uh, so you're looking at CO2 storage. You may also use the thermal properties of salt. Uh, so let me just change the laser pointer here. You may be looking for the thermal properties of salt to start exploring for geothermal energy uh, above the salt because the salt is thermally conductive. Perhaps most importantly, you might also want to switch focus to start looking inside the salt. Now let me just turn that on. I'll switch that, turn that off. Uh, you may want to switch attention to inside the salts and start to think about storing uh, hydrogen, compressed air, and other fluids and gases inside salt caverns using the sealing properties of salt. But of course, salt is not just homogeneous in its nature. It's more complex than that, and as we'll be discussing as we move through. So for this talk, we're just going to very, very quickly uh, kind of run through uh, some of the fundamental characteristics of how uh, salt tectonics can influence the energy transition, looking particularly at hydrogen storage or salt cavern storage. Then we're going to look at uh, CO2 storage and then geothermal energy. Okay. And we'll just for each one, we're going to outline the demands, you know, why salt is important, and outline some of the challenges. Um, particularly interesting fa facets and approaches that can be used on a very, you know, first pass basis, but hopefully give you uh, some idea, um, some thoughts. So we'll start off thinking about uh, hydrogen storage and or more generally, probably more, more usefully termed just salt cavern storage. And so we're focusing here on hydrogen storage because we're thinking there's going to be a transition to uh, a hydrogen based economy over the coming uh, decades. Um, and as a result of that, there's going to be, need to be a significant increase and in upscaling in um, subsurface storage of, of this hydrogen. Um, now, there's a number of ways that you can store hydrogen in the subsurface. You can store it in lined caverns. Uh, you can potentially store it in porous reservoirs uh, as well, in aquifers. However, the only one that's proven to actually work up to now, and there's obviously there's a, a vast amount of research going on at this at the moment, the only one that's actually proven to have stored hydrogen is salt caverns. 
Okay, and there's some examples, I think there's four classic examples where this is, where hydrogen has been stored. And those are in the uh, US Gulf Coast and in the Zechstein on, in Northeastern England. And so just to give you a bit of a, a sense of the scale of this problem, potentially, I just want to highlight this, this thing, this box at the bottom, which is an estimate um, from what we think are quite reasonable sources. So from Bloomberg and, and some uh, energy transition hydrogen based think tanks in Europe. OK, and based on their estimate, they suggest that by 2050, um, if kind of quite strict um, climate policies are in, enacted now and global warming is restricted to 1.5 degrees, we'll be in a situation where there'll be 700 million metric tons uh, of hydrogen being used at that point. And if you use a quick back of the envelope calculation and suggest that you want to store 20% of that, um, that's going to require 14,000 salt caverns, which would cost, well, 637 billion uh, is that estimate. So the potential of this is, is quite vast um, in, in, in one estimate. And also bear in mind that each one of those salt caverns uh, will be big enough to engulf the uh, Empire State Building. Okay, so the there's a lot of work needs to be done, and the scale of this is quite vast. So how does salt tectonics play into this? Obviously, we're thinking about salt from a salt cavern perspective. Well, the fundamental thing, and this was touched on by Leo towards the end of his talk there, is that salt bodies are not heterogeneous, they're not homogeneous blobs of halides. They're highly heterogeneous features, and they can contain a wide variety of structures, uh, of fluids, of gases, and a wide range of lithologies as well. And they can be contorted in all sorts of ways, as you can see in these two examples here. So we, here we have a, an example from a cross section from a German salt mine, uh, German salt diaper with uh, some salt mine uh, shafts uh, illustrated for scale through there, highly contorted. Here we see an example from offshore Brazil, where the top of the salt is in this red, is this red reflection. So you can see that the stuff below it here is inside the salt and is uh, There's a lot of reflectivity and you've got a recumbent fold and all sorts of crazy, crazy geometries going on in there. So that's so salt stocks are heterogeneous, but why do we need to know and why do we need to understand uh, this heterogeneity? Well, from, from a salt cavern perspective, there's a num number of reasons and a lot of them centre around safety. So the first one, if you're going to be drilling your salt caverns, you, you drill your salt, you drill a well, and then you uh, pour water down there to leach out a salt cavern. When you drill, you want to, you want to understand what hazard you may encounter as you drill. So if, if you encounter uh, heterogeneities or unusual pressures, um, this can cause uh, blowouts, it can cause shearing or buckling uh, of well casing, and it's fundamentally quite dangerous. So you need to understand what you're drilling through. The second aspect is you need to place your salt caverns safely. You don't want to place your salt caverns near some, near some of these peculiar heterogeneities inside salt. You want to put them in more predictable areas where stresses uh, are simpler. So you want to be looking for nice clean halides, uh, as this figure shows on the left here. You can see that they're strategically placed. Third point is that salt cavern shape is also highly sensitive to heterogeneities inside salt. Um, so you need to know the composition of what's going to be exposed on your cavern walls. So in an ideal world, your caverns will be nice cylinders. But if in your cavern walls you have, for example, potassium or magnesium salts, they could be planes of preferred, preferred, dissolu preferred dissolution uh, that can lead to rapid dissolution. This can lead to all sorts of problems, can actually connect up caverns, which is incredibly unsafe and incredibly dangerous, uh, and also can lead to loss of product. So them are the main reasons why we need to understand uh, the heterogeneity inside salt stocks. So, as I say, the fundamental driver for salt tectonic research is all centered on predicting, or at least informing us on the nature, distribution, uh, and configuration of heterogeneities inside salt bodies. And we can drill down into that a little bit more um, by thinking about some fundamental questions about what sort of research questions we would ask uh, within that. So, for example, we know that, uh, as, as Leo showed as well, that these, that these evaporite sequences, they're not just halides, they can contain anhydrite, um, potassium magnesium salts, uh, carbonates, uh, and so on. 
uh, deposited horizontally. But as they deform and get incorporated into salt dikers, these things will break apart and they will flow in all sorts of unusual ways. And so what we need to understand is under different boundary conditions, how those things break apart and flow and where, where those heterogeneities, where those carbonates and where those potassium magnesium salts end up in the diaper. Related to that, you may also want to understand a little bit about how shear zones are distributed inside salt stocks. So these are somewhat enigmatic features which have been documented in some basins. For example, as you can see here uh, on this example from a Louisiana uh, salt dome here, this is a top salt map from, Louis from a Louisiana salt dome. And the kind of the salt mining community typically starts to predict where these black lines or shear zones are within the salt dome. Now, how these shear zones form and what they even are, um, that's so-called anomalous zones, it's really quite peculiar and not well understood. Uh, and so some salt tectonic influence and interpretation of those and, and modeling is required, we think. We think there's also value in understanding how uh, inclusions get incorporated into salt diapairs, and where they end up, and where they where they end up in a diapair through time and at different stages. And we can tackle this using a variety of techniques. We can look at natural uh, salt diapairs. So we can use aerial photos here. For example, this is effectively a depth slice through a salt diapair from the Great Kavir, and you can see all sorts of internal geometries that you can study and start to infer uh, and, and see the applicability from, these, from this modern energy transition perspective. You can use salt mining data so from the solution mining community. So people have been drilling caverns for a long, long time, um, but they've been doing this kind of without a, a detailed salt tectonic perspective, and which is going to be required if we're going to upscale. And we can also use seismic data, uh, as we've shown, although there are all sorts of problems and research questions around that too, because seismic data often does a poor job of imaging uh, heterogeneities inside salt structures. Um, and so there's gonna be all sorts of, of potential new research associated with thinking about new survey design parameters, uh, thinking about uh, advanced new processing techniques from a geophysical perspective and using other uh, novel geophysical tools to find better ways to Im image inside salt at quite, what is actually quite shallow depths. You're looking at your salt caverns between 500, and two, 500 meters and two kilometers, which is much uh, shallower uh, than typical oil and gas data, uh, industry data is focusing. The other side, which is obviously particularly relevant to the, uh, the audience today, is making use of uh, analog, uh, sorry, physical uh, and numerical models. So. We've got some examples here from, uh, this is an example from one of Tim Dooley's physical models uh, showing some, a couple of mini basins which have sank down into a layered evaporite sequence. And you can see the heterogeneities inside the salt here as shown by these colored beds. And you can see the contortions uh, within them. And so, which also was mirrored in Leo's uh, numerical model. And so understanding how these heterogeneities are distributed in three dimensions uh, may lead us to some predictive capacity um, when we study different boundary conditions. Likewise, we can use uh, some numerical models. In this case, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting here something from Madi Hadari at the Applied Geodynamics Laboratory, uh, who's done some uh, preliminary work looking at uh, how, uh, I'll just play the movie, where we have some assault body here in pink, where we have some heterogeneities in there. I think in this case, there's some weak, weak units, some bitter salts. And if we see what happens when you uh, let that die appear grow, you can see that those heterogeneities deform and contort and flow in some quite, uh, quite exciting and interesting ways. Okay, so, uh, and there's a lot uh, of work that needs to be continued on that vein as well to understand these heterogeneities. Now we'll move on. Um, so that's, that's dealing with the salt caverns uh, quite quickly. We'll now move on to think about geothermal energy and how salt basins and how salt tectonics are influenced there. <clears throat> now, from a geothermal perspective, a fundamental characteristic is that salt channels heat. It's more thermally conductive than the surrounding rocks. So what that means is it can elevate the temperatures at quite shallow depths, at more than in the surrounding rocks. And this can lead to more efficiencies in terms of drilling and it can make it more efficient and economic uh, when you're searching for your ge geothermal energy. Okay. Now, some examples of this um, have shown that 
it's possible for the uh, positive temperature anomaly at the top of a salt diaper to be 15 to 35 degrees Celsius higher than the surrounding rocks. Okay, so there's some examples um, from the Gulf of Mexico, and I think in some, some modeling from the uh, Zextan region. And I think in, in, in terms of how this would be used, I think it's, it's foreseen that using the geothermal uh, anomalies above salt domes would be used for district heating networks uh, quite strategically. Uh, for example, if you had salt domes, for example, in the Netherlands, in a highly populated area uh, with lots of salt domes, you can exploit the heat thermal properties from above them uh, and feed local district heating networks. Um, and this would, be, this would contribute uh, to a wider portfolio of energy transition technologies. It's not, I wouldn't imagine it being a huge component, uh, but it could be, it could contribute. But it's not just as simple as just uh, drilling a well directly above a salt dome and tapping the heat. In general, that may, that may be the general trend, but there are all sorts of other factors that can come into play that we need to understand from a salt tectonic perspective. So for example, we need to think about the 3D geometry of the salt. We need to think about the depth of that salt, the top depth of the top of that salt. We need to think about the spacing of, of, of diapirs because diapirs don't form on their own, they form in arrays. So you know, can diapirs you know, thieve heat from one another? Are there particular pathways that the heat takes? Does the connectivity of the salt diapirs and the depth of the, the source of the salt influence heat flow? Likewise, we also might want start, want start to want to think about how the composition of the salt influences how heat is distributed. We also want to think about how fluids may move around the salt and interact with fractures and permeable beds around the salt. So these will all impact how heat is distributed, distributed around these salt structures. And to highlight this kind of additional complexity, uh, we'll just, we can just show you now here, um, uh, what is effectively a, a depth, well, this is a, a temperature map uh, taken at 10,000 feet uh, below the ground, below the surface, and above a salt diaper in Louisiana. Okay, so this is, this is an area that's been drilled extensively, so you have bottom hole temperatures uh, from your wells, which are telling you the temperatures. And in general, so you can see the outline of the diaper here is shown by these, uh, this black outline here, so that's where the diaper is. Now, if you were just on a very simplistic level, you would expect to see a bullseye pattern in terms of the temperature contours uh, above this. You'd expect that the hottest temperature to speak to be right in the middle of the diaper and things to be radiating away. Now, in general, temperature is increasing above the diaper, but you can see it's more complex than that. You've, all, you've got these uh, hot spots in certain locations above the diaper, cool spots in others. And then you've got this hot spot around the edge of the diaper. So there's obviously something, a second order overprinting effect. Um, and we've got to think about what that may be. So one line of potential research, which will be interesting to start studying, will be thinking about how features outside the salt have contributed to this. So again, this is thinking about how these faults uh, that you get around salt structures uh, and how, the, how fracture systems around salt structures could interact with, with, with fluids and di the distribution of permeable beds. Uh, to influence uh, where the heat is distributed. Yeah, so that's, that's one set, thinking about what's going on outside the salt. The other side, I think, is particularly interesting uh, by thinking about what's going on inside the salt. So we've seen that salt you know, flows in certain directions. You can see from you know, Leo's figure there that there's a flow uh, characteristic inside salt domes. And we can illustrate that here from a, one of Maria Nicolinaku's figures. Well, this is this is this this map here is showing a salt structure with the thermal with the velocities of the salt colored uh, here. So red is indicating fast flowing salt, blue is indicating slow flowing salt. So there's a plume of salt moving out, being ejected from beneath this mini basin here. So how could these sorts of factors, how could the flow of this salt influence how heat is distributed inside your dome? You may also want to think about, well, what if this salt dome was made of a, a laid evaporite sequence? How would the evaporite, how would the different evaporite mineralogies influence how heat is distributed? So there's a lot of work that here that can be done. Um, and obviously, physical and numerical modeling here, particularly numerical modeling, uh, it would be a value in this research.
The final one, the final thing we're going to just quickly go over is thinking about CO2 storage and the role of CO, the role of salt tectonics in that aspect. So CO2 storage now. So, so salt basins and CO2, how are they linked and, and how could they be useful to one another? Well, we know that the demand for CO2 storage right now is, is huge and that the global rate of CO2 storage is two orders of magnitudes lower uh, than what's needed, uh, according to some estimates. In general, the most likely places where CO2 storage is going to be conducted at a large scale uh, very early on, two of, those, uh, two of those basins are going to be the US Gulf Coast uh, and the North Sea. And that's because um, those are close to areas where there's lots of emissions, lots of, of CO2 emitted and lots of industry, where the geology is really well known. So you're going to understand your confining intervals, your reservoirs, uh, how fluid flow properties in these basins, given the, the, the many decades of oil and gas exploration. And it's also politically friendly in those areas for this to occur. Um, <clears throat> Now, the key thing is that those basins, both the North Sea and the US Gulf Coast, are strongly influenced by salt. Um, got the Zechstein salt in the North Sea, and you have the Luan salt in the Gulf Coast. And you can see an example here of the, the Gulf Coast. This is a section from onshore on the left to offshore on the right, and the salt is covered in red. Okay? You can see you've got some complex salt tectonics. And the CO2 storage interval, predicted interval where you would inject your CO2, is highlighted here. And you can see throughout that interval, salt is clearly deforming and influencing those intervals. Yeah. And so from a, a CO, so that's, that's quite important. So from that perspective, yeah, it's, it's clear that the, the mobility of the salt is going to influence the reservoir architecture, and it may also uh, result in potential seal risks due to the faults and fractures associated with salt movement. And so just a quick, uh, this is now a final slide before I conclude, just outlining the kind of the challenges around CO2 storage. So as I've mentioned, the key thing about salt is it's mobile. So the mobility of the salt and the growth of the salt structures is going to deform uh, the basin floor or your seabed. And therefore it's gonna influence uh, depositional systems, the nature of those depositional systems. And it's called, also going to influence uh, the, the character and the architecture and the quality and the distribution even of the reservoirs which will be targets for CO2 storage. Okay, so that's where we're going with this. It's all about understanding paleotopography and deposition and how this may influence the heterogeneity of your reservoirs and so on on, on, quite, on quite a fine scale. The other aspect to think about is thinking about the containment risks in salt basins. So um, obviously, around salt structures, there's lots of faults, uh, and these faults, you need to understand their geometry, their distribution, their nature, and their evolution through time. Um, and you also, because these areas may be, be areas of potential leakage for CO2 storage, for CO2. So we also need to understand the sealing properties of these different faults and different families of faults that occur around salt bodies and in salt basins. And ultimately, I mean, you can see here, that we're going to have these, well, can envisage uh, a kind of uh, situation where we reimagine a kind of petroleum play concepts for CO2 storage. So much of this issue of containment and, and paleotopography has been well studied uh, for an um, oil and gas perspective, but it's now about reframing that with a CO2 storage perspective. So for example, in one of these cartoons here, you could imagine a situation where you inject your CO2 inside a kind of into a reservoir in a salt withdrawal sink line. Here you inject it, damned it, and let the CO2 migrate up dip and be confined by some shales or something in your sequence, in your, in your withdrawal basin. The CO2 will migrate up towards the salt, and as it does so, it will encounter heterogeneities, uh, and it will also um, dissolve and be trapped in pore throats and so on, before, hopefully, before it actually gets anywhere near the salt. But as a backup, you need to understand the potential leakage risks of the CO2 around the salt structures. Okay, So we're all about building and developing on these, these, these kind of play concepts for different situations that, that occur in salt basins, uh, and some of which were touched on by Leo earlier. So now to conclude, 
So we, we've very quickly run through uh, how salt tectonics can be important to a range of energy transition technologies. And we've highlighted some of the key challenges, the demands, and some of the approaches we can use uh, to tackle these and, and deploy these things at scale. It's clear that if you want to exploit these features, uh, salt basins, uh, and the sediment surrounding the salt, the salt and the sediment surrounding the salt, you need to understand the composition of the salt. You need to be able to image and constrain the geometry and evolution of the salt structures. And you also need to understand the context of the salt structures, as Leo showed with those physical and numerical models. There's all sorts of complex kinematic relationships going on inside salt basins. Ultimately, we need to reframe and apply existing knowledge from oil and gas, from academic research, and from the solution mining, our salt cavern mining communities, uh, to kind of get this uh, energy transition focus building and moving quickly. Each salt basin, each salt body will have its own risk profile regarding each of these energy transition technologies. Um, and the final thing is ultimately, I think I'll close out with the fact that salt tectonic understanding will help us optimize design, reduce the risk and improve the efficiency for a range of energy transition technologies. And so with that, um, I will uh, close out.